Mr. Amara Teha and dear participants, very good evening and welcome to night webinar on Myanmar and the world. Uh, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and is an independent, political, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of peace, security are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. Bimster countries are of great importance to us. Uh, in this context, today we are going to talk about Myanmar. Uh, though the country is in the region, people in Nepal have limited understanding about the country, which resembles with Nepal in many ways. And to discuss on uh, several aspects of Myanmar, we have invited Mr. Amara Thiha. Amara Thiha is a senior research manager, security, at the Myanmar Institute of Peace and Conflict, uh, Peace and Security, uh, and managed the Security Dialogue Project and China Research Desk. He was also a non-resident fellow at the Simpson Center in 2018. Amara served in Technical Secretariat Center of Joint Ceasefire Monitoring Committee as a research manager. In his role, he served as the person responsible for the organizational development of the Joint Ceasefire Monitoring Committee and for the establishment of the Technical Secretariat Center. He served in Myanmar Peace Center from 2013 to 2016 and supported the nationwide ceasefire negotiations. He was involved in the drafting process of nationwide ceasefire agreement from the beginning throughout its signing and help establishment the implementation bodies of nationwide ceasefire agreement. Uh, Amara is a PhD candidate at Imbra University, Portugal, and holds the postgraduate degree from Uppsala University and Orebro University in Sweden. He is also 2017 Asia Fellow, William P. Fuller Fellow on Conflict Resolution. Today, the program will be moderated by Dr. Monish Thorang Ban. Uh, Dr. Monish Thorang Bam is a visiting fellow at NICE. He's a senior uh, assistant professor at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, India, and a coordinator of Northeast Study Center at uh, the same institute. Uh, he was a visiting fellow at University of Cincinnati, Ohio, a South Asian voice, visiting fellow at the Henry L. Stimson Center, Washington, DC, and many others. Uh, we, was, we once again uh, welcome our distinguished speaker, Amara Tiha, to our webinar. Now I'd like to hand over the floor to Dr. Monish. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pramod. Um, it's an uh, absolute pleasure on my part uh, to have Amara Thiha uh, speaking to us today. Um, not only because he has an expertise field and widely known and read, uh, but also because um, you know, uh, it's also a opportunity for us to uh, meet each other virtually uh, after having met as uh, fellows at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. And since then, I have uh, great pleasure to follow uh, the events body of work that Mara has been involved at with the uh, uh, Myanmar Institute for Security, uh, which looks at peace negotiation in Myanmar, peace building and development federalism and constitutional reform and dialogue in this very important country. Before I hand over to Man, um, uh, the one thing that I would like to point out to the audience is that when we talk about Myanmar uh, in this part of uh, the world, you know, most of our discussion seems to focus on either talking about uh, Rohingya issues or either talking about uh, the activist policy vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar or either talking about um, you know, uh, infrastructure projects and connectivity. Uh, that's why when uh, I and Pramod uh, you know, was thinking about this particular webinar, we thought that it's very important for us, um, you know, for us to rather understand uh, how Myanmar views the world and also to understand the perception of Myanmar about how the world views Myanmar. And that's uh, the central idea with which we really designed this webinar. And I could not think of a better person, my good friend Amara, you have to speak on this issue. So without further ado, I will not stand between you and Amara. Uh, welcome Amara, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome to NICE, we look forward to you. Thank you. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting on this panel. And I'm very honored and I'm really honored to share information related on how Myanmar see the world. So it is a very difficult to 
it's a, it's a quite difficult thing to say that how Myanmar sees to the global actors in the world for two things. The first thing is, you know, it may be the view from the elite policymaker and also it may be also the public discourse on how we must see the world. Because nowadays, diplomacies and international engagement is not only about the policymaking level, but rather on the people to people relations are also driving force on the diplomacy and the relation. So of course, you know, we cannot get away from the elephant in the room, the Rohingya crisis. This is something that shaped how Myanmar engaged in the past five years with the international actors. And of course, you know, the infrastructure project with China. And, but you know, there are some more other actors that involved in Myanmar and international engagement that people usually forgot or not mention about that. The first thing is India. And how Myanmar engaged with India is a very interesting part, especially with the Myanmar military and how Myanmar military and Myanmar government see India as a spiritual and also the guidance, not, not only right now, but for the, gen, for the generations before us. And also, we also need to look on, we have to look on how Myanmar engage with uh, Japan and Korea and also other countries like Taiwan. This is something that we all, I would like to focus more on in here. That is something that people should be don't mention about that. And also need to talk about how we engage with the business actors in the European Union, because the way that European, the relation between European Union and Myanmar is another level that we usually don't see that much. So let's start with India. So, uh, you know, people usually consider, and if you're looking from the outside part, if you see Myanmar and India relation is more like balancing act of China, but it is actually more than that, right? I mean, India support Myanmar, Myanmar on the state-to-state -state relation since the beginning that we independence together, it's in 1947-48. So since then, we work closely together, we share the history, we share the knowledge, and we share how we construct the statehood and everything. And right now, Myanmar military and Myanmar government is looking on how India structure their federalism and how India structure their security forces and how we are going to adopt these structural and sub-state formation from India. So this is how we study from there. And for decades, we also have a very strong connection and relationship with India. This is how we acquired the India Kilo Sub in the previous few months ago. We got a first submarine from India. We got a training on the naval warfare. And India also supporting Myanmar military back on the international arena after the democratic reform in 2015. So India is always our good friend that we usually forget about that. But India, the relation with India is a lot more deeper than the more deeper than the trade or the power sharing. It's more like a how we engaging on the spiritual level and how we're engaging our moral issues and India is somehow our guidance thing. For Japan, I mean, people usually do not see Myanmar and J Japanese relation is, you know, just shallow, but it's not like that. You know, Japanese supporting the peace process for a while, they have been invest a lot. And right now, major investor in Myanmar are Japan. And then we always consider Japanese and trustworthy investor. So the relation with Japanese is always good, no matter the Rohingya issues and upcoming there. So we are keeping it up there. But, you know, of course, the, the way the Japanese, you know, engaging in the business activities a lot slower, but more comprehensive and firmer than others. So it, it is another way of we are trying to improve the, our own internal systems and compliance mechanisms. This is how the Japan is. Korea, the same thing. You know, we are now engaging with Korea, more in the people-to-people -people relationship. And we are also trying to make a technical transfer and trying to get more in-depth relation with Korea too. But Taiwan is another issue. So for Taiwan, I mean, for, for the generation before that, that we have a kind of strange love-hate relation with Taiwan because of the Kuomintang administration. And then later on, we try to, there are more many Burmese Chinese immigrants in Taiwan who lead the tech industry in Taiwan and that the relation is quite stronger. So what we are looking at is more Taiwan investment on the different uh, tech sector in Myanmar and Myanmar always see Taiwan as uh, something 
that we can learn and acquire that transfer in there. So this is something that you know, we usually don't know. And the most interesting actor that we mentioned is quite far, but uh, it is kind of important is Russia. So people usually do not talk about Russia, but Russia was a primary uh, supporter and our one of the close alliance, uh, not only for the military, but for the administration. So we engage quite closely with Russia and we engage quite closely and trying to looking on how our strategic uh, uh, offshoot or offset uh, along with the Russia and India. This is how, how we are seeing on. So, but of course, you know, the relation with the United States is quite sour and it's not very good. It's not true thing. The first thing is, you know, Trump administration don't have a proper uh, diplomacies and proper strategy over not only on Myanmar, but the whole uh, Asia, like Barack Obama and China, as already you probably know that, you know, China invests, China is planning to invest a lot on Belt and Road and China in my economic corridor, but Myanmar already lost the chance to get the cheaper loan. So we are also now reconsidering the Chinese model for the debt trip and now China also reconsidering for their business model on the BRI too. So the projects on the China in my economic corridor will be slower uh, and then it can become even slower because of the COVID-19 and possible upcoming election in October and November. So this is a, something that, you know, the Chinese investment will not coming up and upcoming at least until 2021, April, and May. So this is the how we see the world right now, at least for the major power. Oh yes, European Union. So the way that we see the European Union is quite strange because of the Rohingya issues and ICJ issue. Some administration, some governments are not very uh, happy on Myanmar and also the Myanmar is not very happy with some uh, member states in the European Union. But when the COVID-19 hit on Myanmar on the government factories and government sector, European Union is the only country that invests and then inject the capital in inflow for the workers there. So the relation has somehow become positive again after the last year ICJ issue. So this is how we see the European Union right now. This is how the not only the policymaker, but the whole public discourse is looking on with these actors right there. So yeah, so if you have any, would like to, or would you like to intervene or should I follow up? Okay. Ma, I think you can follow up and then at the end we can, uh, you know. Oh, okay. So, so for the, for the, uh, for the neighboring states, let's say about the RCN. So, so the RCN is always, um, ASEAN is something that, you know, they usually don't intervene each other, right? But they try to form their own uh, policies and their own ups there. So Myanmar right now is start thinking on that, you know, how we're going to engage not only with the big power and how we, but also trying to looking on how we're going to maintain with our own autonomy. So this is something that we are trying to pushing on is the idea is called the strategic autonomy. How we gonna strategically put ourselves and maintain our autonomy in this global rivalries. Of course, you know, uh, this is this is not only about the China and China bloc and, and the you know United States and Western blocs and competing and choosing a side. No, not at all. You know, Myanmar do not choose a side since the Cold War, right? We do not choose a side, and we are the one of the early founding members of the non-alignment movement. So we still want to maintain this independent and active foreign policies, and we are also trying to improve it with the strategic autonomy. So keeping the strategic autonomy and keep maintaining as autonomy of the smaller state like us, you know, ASEAN is a key major actor, even though the, the ASEAN is a lot slower compared with other actors. We are trying to keep it firm. So the only, the, the only downside is, you know, the uh, Myanmar relation with the border countries like India is pretty positive and we cooperate a lot, not only in the security and politically, but as I mentioned, ideologically. But for the Bangladesh, it's not, the, not always a good thing uh, in the, in, at least in the, how can I say, um, public discourse. Uh, that is because of the uh, marine time issue in the last decades and also concern with the ranger issue. You might consider Bangladesh is trying to, uh, you know, taking the steps on it. And after losing some of the business and to the Bangladesh special government sector, the purpose discourse on the Bangladesh are not very good. And for the Laos, it's pretty stable. We usually don't make any comment for that. Thailand, the relation with Thailand is one of the peak right now uh, because, you know, because probably because of the Thailand administration right now 
and we tried to make it keep good relation with Thailand since 2005, six, and then we maintain on this. But we are still not very sure that how the Thailand policies on the workers, returning workers uh, in the upcoming months, uh, because of the COVID-19, many workers from Thailand come back Burma, and then if the Thailand do not accept in the upcoming months, and then the situation may be a little more tricky part. For the ASEAN, it's pretty fine. And we are engaging with a lot of us in activities, but memorials still need to, you know, go more active. And this is something that we still don't have a proper policies and strategy on the how we gonna engage with what actors for the what benefit and what interest. It is something that we are still need to do so. So right now, you know, because of we are more reactive in the recent years, all the policies are based on how international actors engage on us and how we gonna protect ourselves from the, our own autonomy. This is something we are a little bit far behind if you compare with the other international engagement. So this is somehow concerned with the, you know, uh, uh, in the neighboring countries. So China, you know, the, the relation to China is kind of strange. I mean, it's a kind of, you know, love-hate relationship, right? Uh, the first thing is, and it's big, and then we cannot get away from China for sure, because we will be there for centuries. And at the same time, you know, China is one of the largest trading partners, and we always rely on China, not only the import and export, but also for the nowadays focus on what tech, finance, and also the, uh, the, around the uh, security, around the borders, and almost everything, we interact a lot with China. But at the same time, you know, people are not very happy the over Chinese hegemony over Myanmar because you know one is more and more that you know the Chinese impose their hegemony over Myanmar for the different area, not only politically but uh, especially on the new tech area, like you know fintech area, we pay and we pay are now using as a primary mean of uh, payment on the border states. In some areas, China has even issued a special uh, residence card to the. Uh, the peoples in the border area that is that that got even you know better than the NRC got for the Myanmar state this kind of thing and at the same time China is also supporting and keeping the armed actors around around the border as the buffer situation this is something that you know the security actors like Myanmar military is not very happy and this is how they claim openly in upcoming uh, previous days that they are not really happy the Chinese uh, supporting on the on the on the actors, uh, ethnic armed groups. So you know, these ethnic armed groups are really strong, uh, and some of them even acquire the um, uh, surface-to-air missiles for the defense and everything. So this is something that we are need to we need to work it on. Of course, you know some uh, Myanmar Myanmar business persons and those who are in doing in business in Myanmar is looking for Chinese part because the Chinese investment is a lot more easier and a lot more faster than if you compare with Japanese or Korean or the United States. Because you net, if you work with the United States and they took a lot of compliance and then there are a lot of sanctions still up there, the European Union needs a lot of due diligence and compliance mechanism, getting a loan is not difficult, but China and SoftBank is other issues. So a lot of business persons and entrepreneurs really want to get the CMEC to get done as you know as early as possible. But uh, but at the same time, the administration is a little bit hesitate to move it on without having balancing the China with the other actors. So this is a relation with China. It's a little bit, you know, lovely relation, but it, indeed, you know, China should be and they will be our strategic partners for the, you know, more or less forever. But this is how we're going to balance and how we're going to maintain our strategic autonomy. We also need our strategic partner, especially on the India, Russia, and maybe from the West, but with this, with this administrations and ongoing range of issue, engaging with the West is still far to reach it out, at least for upcoming years, because range of issue will be there and then we need to settle it first. But rather, rather focusing on the issue alone, you know, it, will, it's also, it can also be an opportunity to work with the West together to solve, the, solve this crisis. So this is something that we are trying to push it on. This is how we, from the different commissions, from the late Kofi Annan together to resolve this Kofi Annan issue. This is something we are working on. So, uh, what are the external factors and domestic factors that, you know, uh, impact the country ties. I mean, the, the external factors are, you know, the United States foreign policy over Asia. That is, a, that is something that we all know that, you know, Trump administrations 
strategic policy is more focused on the more reactive stance on you know North Korea and China rather than you know trying to make it a clear policy over the upcoming decades or not. They, they don't really have it. So this is very, it's also the impact on Myanmar that you know the relation with Myanmar and the United States become um, quite cold after the Trump administration. And you know, but we with the upcoming I mean, administration, we don't know yet, but it may also become a, become a, be another issue that we will be better. Uh, for the European Union, I mean, you know, European Union still supporting us, uh, because the European Union always support us to make uh, structural reforms, both economic and governance, and so they got uh, many programs along with, you know, my goal for the political reforms and um, my constitution for constitutional reform and federalism, this kind of thing. So they are a lot supporting on us for the institutional reform and they perform as a dialogue partner. Uh, so they they will become one of the key main player. So a lot of European co companies are still investing and then they are in investing more and more every, each and every day. So probably they will become the prior, one of the strategic partners for the democratic reforms and internal reforms. So this, the, the, the different thing is, you know, Chinese investment is focused more on the profit and then making the money, but the European business is more focused on the compliance and you know, making the better business environment in the longer term. But the European Union have a, don't have a strength and they don't have the economic strength enough to compete with China over Myanmar. So what they are looking on and what, they are, what we are proposing right now is, rather than looking at the external competition force against China, they will become the contractor. So for example, when we form, when we are going to build the railway, the China is going to invest, the is going to invest, and then we are looking for the European countries to implement the project, like, like probably maybe MNE, or maybe we're going to use the European companies to contract it so we can get a better you know, joint project together. But this is somehow, you have seen the same model in the western part of China and also the Chinese investment railways in the eastern part of Europe too. So seamen also involved in this kind of business activities in China too. So Chinese invest, they might invest in European Union and those European companies are going to be the third person contractor going to impl implement the project. But of course, you know, most of the European countries also invest in China, so the, the products were coming from China too. This is somehow we are trying to model it, and this is how the European Union is looking on their own position on this kind of projects, especially on the you know solar power project. It will be the same. We both have a high power project. It's the same thing. So, this is the European Union issues. Thailand invests in Myanmar, but you know uh, not a lot now. Right now, the Singapore invests in Burma, but it's due to the Singapore as a third, third country that holds a lot of you know, international companies. So they use the name this our Singapore invests in all its highest in there. And external factors, you know, the Rohingya issue going to be get it done first. Uh, without this issue, without with this issue, it will be very difficult for not only for economic issue but also for our security forces to be more democratically reformed. That because of the Rohingya issues, all military to military cooperation, uh, you know, uh, attempts or are, have, 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 have been postponed by the Western countries. So we need to get it done and we need to make it reform of the security sector. So uh, this is the external issues that we have experienced. The domestic factor right now is, you know, Myanmar government is focused all for last decades, Myanmar government is focused more on the domestic issue rather and they try to uh, fix it up without having international engagement much. Right. Uh, apart from the Uthenting administration, you know, Uthenting administration tried to fix internal domestic problem with the external help like European unions and United States. But uh, right now, the government always say that okay, this is time to step back, and that this is something we need to look in our own and our own solution rather than engaging with the external stakeholders too much. That is. That is somehow required for first few years because you know uh, during that time you know we got pretty, pretty much mess up on the different external involvement with the different interests like you know a lot of you know fundings are coming up for the different political agenda but this is somehow we also need to reconcile and we also need to think it on how what's the strategy what's the amount needed from the external actors and we also have to seek it out strategically of the help other than you know just opening everything. So this is the domestic issue. So what's the Myanmar's engagement with the wall in the upcoming months or years? Um, 
the thing is, you know, to be honest, we don't know. Uh, we don't know mean um, there will be an election. And usually uh, this year, I mean, from 2015, so 2016 to 2020, we don't have much, you know, clear foreign policies. And most of them have been reacted to the international issues, right? Myanmar don't have, Myanmar even don't have clear position on how we going to stand on different international issues like North Korea or the South China Sea. Of course, we must support in the South China Sea because of China. Uh, we must stand on the Chinese side on the South China Sea because of Chinese thing. But um, we don't have a clear policies and we don't have a clear, uh, uh, clear you know, guidelines on how we're going to engage. This is something we need to formulate it. So the, for this, you know, we, we right now need is a clear foreign policy white paper. And that is, I heard it's still the process and then it still need to be ratified by the upcoming parliament and the parliament after the ratify the basic principle. And then of course, you know, we can start looking on with the stakeholder mapping that who we want from what and who, and that this is somehow we should engage on that. But uh, Myanmar will become be part of the ASEAN and then and the BIM step forward quite actively because we believe this is a, for working level, these are quite effective for us. Uh, for and we will engage more with India for upcoming years for sure, and China will be there. I mean, uh, of course, you know, for India we have to engage a lot to keep the relation. But with China, you know, the, the the force is pretty big, so it will become ruling basic. Then and the Chinese will coming up, you know, after they got to recover from COVID nineteen. But the 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 business model will be very different from the way that we know and we understand the BRI or the previous years. It will be very different model and a very different business uh, structure and financing structure on, and then we are still figuring out how to do so. But the China is still pushing on and they are working not only at the union level, but also at the regional government level and also people to people relationship and they are still forcing to get it done. So there will be Chinese investment and Myanmar going to be there. For Russia, we're going to be the strategic alliance so we were still going to be purchasing and we're going to make it more rely on the Russian uh, armaments and Russian uh, strategic, you know, uh, strategic positioning. And then Myanmar will, Myanmar, at least Myanmar military, at least Myanmar military will rely on Russia for sure. Uh, for Bangladesh, uh, there may be, the situation will be a little bit worse because, you know, the, the refugee crisis is not even longer. If that is even longer and longer, then that won't will come getting worse because you know Bangladesh has its own problem inside so we need to work it on but it's the ongoing crisis in Rakhine state is not only with the Rohingya and also with the uh, Buddhist community but also it's a matter of Rakhine also independent movement is there so there will be a little more complex and India will gonna in, should be in India will become part of the issues in upcoming months I think because you know they our economy also smuggle a lot of arms, not only from uh, Bangladesh, they also smuggle arms from India and through, or maybe through the Indian Ocean. So this is something that we need to cooperate at the regional level to get it done, at least on the intelligence sharing and trying to make it a stable region. So, you know, if the situation is got worse in an upcoming year, maybe in 2011 or 12, the, this, you know, tripartite area between England, Myanmar, and Burma will become the uh, conflict spot hot and it will also impact on the Indian strategy, East Act East policies and also, you know, impact on the Chinese, you know, CMAC too. So it will have a more, you know, unstable relation and unstable situation up down there. So we need to make it more stable in that area. And yeah, so this is something that we should, you know, make it more pay attention on it. And then, yeah, this is the overview. And if you have a specific question, then we can work it off. Thank you, Amara. Um, it was splendid. And um, there are, you know, I, 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 uh, it's like uh, the number of questions that have come on chat boxes. I'm just trying to uh, figure out some common themes so that we can get a response in as many questions as possible. Uh, one of the first, I mean, one of the first questions that I put to you, and um, I think this is a over overriding theme in a lot of questions, uh, which is regarding the, uh, you know, the nationwide ceasefire underway, uh, 
talks on the way in Myanmar and the kind of developments that have happened, uh, you know, before the COVID-19 uh, struck in the early parts of uh, January in this year. Uh, so I think a lot of uh, the questions that have come, uh, I would rather put it this way: that uh, you know, why don't why don't you why don't you walk us through uh, what has happened regarding the news, nationwide ceasefire agreement and what might be the near future and what, how would it contribute to uh, you know the stability of uh, Myanmar? So the thing is, you know, NCA, the nationwide ceasefire agreement, you know, is not the ceasefire agreement and usually you know misconfused right NCA is not a ceasefire ceasefire thing you know because those who signed the NCA have to sign the bilateral ceasefire agreement prior or most of them already signed it and so NCA is more like the political framework that allow the stakeholders to get on board with the political uh, dialogue uh, and then you know, we got to from signing a nationwide ceasefire agreement, and then we got to the political dialogue with Union Peace Conference. This is how we have a pin loan process. This is somehow beginning, you know, it's more like a ticket to get in the pin loan process, right? So NCA is, because those who already signed the bilateral ceasefire, you know, they are thinking, right? I mean, okay, right now we already signed the bilateral ceasefire, there is no more fighting, and then why we need to sign the NCA? Right, and because you know some of the uh, privilege were made lost because there will be the joint ceasefire monitoring team going to be the patrolling there. There will be a lot of you know CS and NGOs are monitoring the activities, so some of them really don't want to get involved in that level, right? So, for example, you know, let's say UWSA have a signing a sign the you know nationwide uh, bilateral ceasefire twice, and for thirty years there is no single conflict with UWSA, but they don't want to sign the NCA. Because if they sign the NCA, then there will there may be uh, the process of the joint ceasefire monitoring will along the Chinese border, and there may be a lot of you know uh, the human rights abuse will be reported, and there will be the joint administration and everything will be there, and that they also need to get and sit in the U Union Peace Dialogue that they really don't want it because the autonomy they already acquire is a lot higher and a lot more flexible than those who gonna discuss the Union Peace Dialogue, uh, Union Peace Conference. So for that reason, they don't want to sign the NCA. So let's say the other thing, you know, um, let's say, um, but let's say in for the Kitchen Independence Army, KIA, you know, we don't have a single, we don't have a very, uh, 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 how can I say? We have a fighting, but the relationship, uh, relationship is a lot better. So they the, so the um, number of the fights between KIA and Myanmar is a lot lower in 2019 and now 2020. We have almost no fight at all. Of course, they don't sign the bilateral at all or they don't sign the NCA. So those who are fighting with the, right now the administration is the Arakan Army, the Arakan independence movement and the TNLA and those in Northern, uh, Northern Shan State part. So these two are the guys who are fighting with the central administration right now and the front for the Oregon army is to be another level that government is, you know, consider them as the terrorist group. So they need to, the dialogue is, you know, a lot more difficult to conduct. So for the NCA process, you know, with the, we may have the Union Peace Agreement, a dialogue on the upcoming month in August from 20 to 14, around that time, we are now switching the date. And and but you know this is the last time for this administration and then the, there is because of the COVID-19 there is the shuttle to move with is quite low so we don't have that permanent thing but for the NCA part you know that we are also negotiating with other stakeholders to get on board and a lot of a uh, lot of other groups are going to get involved but it's also a matter of you know how the Union Peace Dialogue outcomes have been positively achieved and implemented you know otherwise Otherwise, you know, those who have been signed and say, okay, you know what, we already have a bilateral ceasefire and the UPC is not really positive, or we don't have any kind of, you know, uh, significant progress, so why we sign the UPC and getting on the board? So, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, successful uh, implementation of, you know, getting on board of the NCA is not only required from the government side, but also those already signed the ceasefire and making the progress forward to get a credible you know, agreement. Otherwise, it's just gonna be in a you know, difficult situation. 
Thank you. Uh, I think another question that is kind of um, uh, flanked up by a number of uh, participants, and uh, I know that that's coming from India, <laughs> because uh, in uh, the media here in recent times, uh, you know, there have been some media reports about, um, uh, you know, I, I think th this has a longer shelf life in the sense that uh, you had a lot of reports about uh, the Michion Dam project and the pullout from that. And then you know going back again so there is this larger sense of like uh, of course the material influence of china is much bigger as compared to i think any other country uh, but uh, back in india i think a lot of um, uh, 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 you know the, the analysis has been on uh, the trust issue and uh, whether in what conditions um, uh, you know myanmar might be sort of like looking towards india uh, even if in a smaller scale uh, on infrastructure projects and investments. Um, and this kind of reports have come up recently that, uh, you know, uh, maybe Myanmar might be looking more favorably towards India. Uh, I think the question is relating to um, your perception of like when Myanmar government takes up such kind of projects with any country for that matter, uh, what are the kind of parameters that it uh, tends to look at? In, uh, in in order to sort of zero on a project and, 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 and take up the project. So if you're looking on the MIG Mega project that we signed with the Chinese, uh, with the, uh, China, like for example, the Miss Dam project and the Changpu deep sea port uh, and, you know, to, uh, and you know, implementation of these uh, MOU on the building, the pipeline and also the railroad, all of these, mega projects have been signed on the previous administration like you know previous administration me not even before Uteng Sen, that is the uh, military regime we also need to know that during this time you might got a pretty tough situation right i mean we got a, we got international sanctions on the democratic uh, human rights abuse and democratic democratic reforms so there is not much you know international investment At the same time india we cannot invest much yet on Myanmar, right? The, during the time, India is still also struggling to keep its own economy as its own base. The time around 2000 uh, into 2007, India is you know growing, but you know they they are not you know going outside yet. So of course, you know in, in that even in that situation, India invests in the Rakhaldan uh, River project and implementation project on the western part of Myanmar in Chin State and Kalei State for the trading from Mizoram to Kalei. So. If you're looking at that, you know, Myanmar need a lot of cash uh, and to make it more float. So this is how they start signing the a lot of agreement with China. But if you're looking on the present administration after the dropping on the missile uh, dam thing, the, the, the Chinese also lost trust on Myanmar too, not only Myanmar, right? China also say, you know, you already dropped missile, right? Uh, if you're looking on the missile project, the project for the Myanmar side is big. But for the Chinese side, that kind of you know hydropower project is not that big or mega at all. That is a very you know usual hydropower project for them. This is only the the bigger size in Myanmar. So and also if you're looking on the power surplus from Yunnan is a lot even higher. And now we are even thinking and considering to purchasing power from the China through the power grid. So the importation for power is not a usual issue too. But the Chinese really don't not very happy and, and happy about this is, you know, how come this small country like Myanmar, you know, trying to, you know, make this thing back to us, right? So this is a trust issue. That's the one reason that, you know, when the Chinese just start, you know, uh, investing a lot of money on the infrastructure project in Sri Lanka or the uh, Djibouti or, uh, or Pakistan, I mean, Myanmar don't get anything. I mean, Myanmar don't get that much, you know, uh, loan or financial support because Chinese already say, you know what, I mean, we already lost it. And interesting part is, you know, the Mison Dam project has been signed by the President Xi Jinping before he was the president. So that is a more like a personal issue that, you know, I, I will come personally to sign this project on and then all the projects have been dropped. So without this thing happen, we are not going to do anything. And of course, you know, Mison Dam project will not going to continue at all. I mean, Chinese already know and that they are not going to push anymore. China is now focused more on the other sector, on the trading posts along the border, infrastructure, on the IT highway. So it's more like a, a 
information technology and that they invest a lot on IT because they know that investing on the fintech and IT will be a lot more benefit to them and building the new new uh, city in the southern part and also the Chao Pew Deep Sea. But these are the guys, these are the things that China are now focusing on. And of course, you know, Myanmar is also trying to use as international actors to also inform in this kind of particular project rather than Chinese alone and try to get away from the debt. This is something that we are working on right now. So of course, you know, India made, the relation with India is always different. You know, it is not competing thing. It's a, it's, it's, the relation with India and relation with China is more like an apple and orange thing, right? I mean, the way that we see India is another another thing, another lab. We don't see India as a more like a, a cash pot. We don't we never see India as a kind of guy that will bring the cash in, but we see India as a more like a, a close friend that we were getting done things together. And for the Chinese side, we always see as a guy with the cash, but at the same time, we are not very happy because we consider the guy's booty. So this is somehow we see it, at least in the public discourse. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a uh, you know kind of a specific question on uh, Myanmar's national comprehensive development plan uh, that envisions a prosperous Myanmar integrated into the global community by 2030. Uh, the specific question is how does Myanmar intend to focus uh, in order to achieve this goal? Ah, it's a hmm. it's a it's a it's a difficult thing, right? I mean. Uh, it, <laughs> of course, you know, we all, let's see, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing that, you know, how are we are going to see the global thing and how we're going to see uh, what, in which sectors, right? I mean, like, for the people to people relation nowadays, you know, we are more engaging with the global community than ever before. Uh, if you're looking for the last 10 years that we are not engaging that much now, we engage more and more to the each levels, not only from the policy making, but for the people to people relation. But at the same time, you know, for the, it, it, for the economic corporations and for the economic engagement more we need to focus more we need to know more about how the international communities are going on and we need to look on how the international trends are going on rather than the rather than focusing too much on the national interest rather than we also need to focus on more into the global uh, politics and global landscape this is not the new thing for us too right i mean Myanmar until 1962 we are one of the guys that smaller state but we are always a guy always on the global arena, walking along with India and Indonesia to get involved in the global, you know, landscape, and we we try to fix it up. Uh, so this is something we need to going on. That's not only require the foreign policy, but we also need to have a more stronger think uh, uh, academic relationship within the region, which is how we kind of portray ourselves in this kind of you know, power competition. Uh, uh, right now, the problem is. Uh, almost all actors, almost all countries in the region are thinking on that how we kind of siding along with India or China or ASEAN, this kind of thing. But this is, this is in no way, this is not the way that we overcome the Cold War, right? The, in the Cold War, the way we maintain our autonomy together and how we kind of form our own idea. This is something we need to develop our own rather than choosing the side. So Myanmar also need to develop our own how we gotta maintain and how we gotta you know work with the other actors together. This is I think this is how the RCN play uh, you know important role in upcoming years. Thank you. Um, Amara that's um, you know um, I, I think you have already mentioned it to some extent but you know given the um, knowing the uh, knowing the uh, uh, you know the professional experience you have had uh, in, in 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 the West, in Europe as well as in uh, the U.S. Um, you know, let it, let me sort of like uh, let's say reframe this question in some sense. Um, what is sort of interesting to me, uh, and and you know there are a lot of uh, assessment and analysis out there uh, from an external perspective to study, is that um, you know when I was sort of like uh, still a student of IR. Um, uh, in 20, I think in 20, 2011, I remember writing this small piece where um, I was sort of referring to John Foster Dulles coming to Myanmar, you know, way back in the 50s. And then I, I was referring to the fact that it took almost like 50 years again, more than 50 years again, for example, uh, for the Obama administration and specifically Hillary Clinton, along with Kurt Campbell, sort of to think of opening up to Myanmar and then 
you know, in, in a very few, uh, like uh, in a very, uh, very rapid sort of a phase, uh, you had like rebalancing strategy, you know, uh, like Myanmar opening, and then Google executives and other guys coming and flowing in, flying into Myanmar. And suddenly, uh, you know, we, we saw a Myanmar uh, engaging with a world in a way that we had never seen before. And that remained, I think, pretty much a kind of a trajectory for some time. And then you had people like Burton Lindner writing about Great Gap East and other things. Uh, but then, and then you also had interesting things like Myanmar taking part in Thailand in Cobra goal exercises for the first time. Uh, and then suddenly you had this phase, uh, you know, with, uh, with Dao Aung San Suu Kyi sort of coming into the whole political framework and the Rohingya issue much more upfront in terms of international image, uh, international attention and other things. And then suddenly, you know, in the last three, four years, I, if I may say so, you have articles and opinion pieces which are, which are, which tend to suggest like, well, Myanmar had its moment, you know, of being sort of a normal country. And then now Myanmar is back into sort of being looked by the West, uh, you know, pushed into the same corner again because of human rights issues or the, the time that has taken in terms of the democratic process and other things. So how do you, as one who works in Myanmar but travels around the world, how do you see this trajectory and the change and the graph of this change? Okay, so, okay, that will be the little bit long question, uh, uh, long answer too. Right, I come back to you know I I, I was I born in nineteen eighty eight during the midst of you know the socialist regime and then I was you know trained in the military regime until two thousand seventeen so I, you know I brought up in military regime and then I go to Sweden right away and, and come back in two thousand twelve two thousand twelve was the interesting year uh, you know everything is not the changing but it start to change but then I come back in two thousand thirteen everything is totally changed right I mean we welcome the President Obama the Mapi Center post and you know, arrange all the meeting with Obama, Hillary Clinton, you know, everyone. I mean, everyone is coming, you know, we got a success story. So there's a two, two, there's a two reason, right? The first thing is, you know, uh, because the reform has been led by the military, right? I mean, it's an interesting story that it's a good story to, good storytelling, right? I mean, uh, this reform is led by the military along with the other elite transformation from the West together. So we see, you know, it's a, Pretty cool, right? I mean, so everyone is writing about that. And I uh, was also in the part of the MPC and transformation team, so I was also pretty happy with that too. I mean, it's a pretty, you know, we all is a high and hype. But at the same time, you know, the, there's a problem since then. I'm mean, Rohingya issue was since then, or actually since before then. And we cannot, you know, fix it up. And of course, you know, uh, we also have a, we also for the, you know, fighting before, human rights issue before. But the problem is, you know, we opening up and we got a positive thing together. So in everyone in 2015 believe that after Don Sun Suji took power in LD administration take power, they will be better. Right? But and they they want like you know two X, you know, like a combo form of democratization from 2015. Right? If you if reform is successful in this rate in 2010 to 15, and then you know now the leaders coming in and why not the 2x or 3x you know, form of combo in there. Uh, and then the problem is uh, the expectation is quite high and uh, the 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 performance is for the administration is quite I cannot say low, but you know they didn't meet the expectation of the international community. That, that's a, that's a big issue, right? So the, the problem remained the same, and some problems even are now even better. For example, the peace process seems like a little bit stall, but you know if you're looking on the uh, community level, on the a little bit better. But at the same time, you know the new administration is they consider they are the democratic saver, so they want to keep saying, okay, we we need to make a reform, and then you know we need to win another election. So they are trying to be more protective, right? So they are start thinking that, okay, those who, whoever trying to, uh, you know, uh, criticize may be the, from the previous administration or they're trying to, you know, down, keep downplay the, their efforts. This is somehow they are also doing and start arresting on the internet issues and so on. This is also affecting on the human rights issue. So another different part is, you know, when we start doing the reform in 2012-13, most of the policies and reforms 
have been done by the military, the ex-military officer with the high-ranking president in Teng Seng, and the recommendations are coming from the Western-led technocrats. They all come back together. And most of them are from previous administration. Everyone has their own agenda and policies, and then they bring in the president approved is pushing, so it's so far. So, but uh, when the new administration of the Autumn uh, coming in, that she don't use all of these technocrats all. I mean, she tried to form his own circle, elite circle. And this is somehow we lost the momentum too, because you know there, there will be another story, right? I mean, there is no uh, institutional memory, there is nothing you know going to give it over. So this is how we lost the momentum on the reform too. But yeah, you know, it's a matter of time. We hopefully that you know after this election there may be some things going on, uh, hopefully. And then let's see that you know, uh, you know, the thing is getting the reform. To be getting to done the reform is not only a matter of you know uh, who is leading on the part, but rather than we need a uh, about two to three hundred level three hundred technocrats. I mean, when we do the reform in 2012, 13, we got about 150 or 100 technocrats, and then we got around another 400 or 600 experts working on this, pushing on that. But right now it's even about 25 percent, and maybe even lower. So actually, we need even more to get it more done. So hopefully after the election. There may be some. Uh, thank you. That's uh, yeah. Um, kind of related question, but um, this is something again. Uh, you know, um, related to I think uh, what you just said about international expectations, and um, uh, you know, in in the beginning when we were just chatting, you we were joking about the fact that uh, Myanmar is kind of a used to be kind of a roundabout where you know, people yeah. fly off and never lands in uh, Myanmar. Uh, you know, it. it uh, although I'm not comparing it, but um, it, it, it tends, uh, it made me think suddenly of, uh, you know, an uh, American sort of calling Afghanistan as a roundabout in Central Asia. Nobody wants to go to Afghanistan, you know. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing about roundabout, uh, which applies, I think, to both Myanmar and Afghanistan is that uh, the roundabout thing, which is, the geographical sort of location of Myanmar between South and Southeast Asia and Afghanistan between South and Central Asia provides opportunities for them to really become this roundabout of uh, you know, inter-regional business commerce activity. But at the same time, in the absence of peace and security, uh, the roundabout may mean that everyone might go around it and not really enter into it, right? So, um, yeah, and, and that brings me to international expectations about like, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what, what kind of, um, let's say, in, in a, uh, those expectations are quite related to investments and opportunities for Myanmar uh, in doing, uh, you know, business with the outside world. Um, how does that international expectations sort of reflect into, let's say, internal decision making in Myanmar and is there a dichotomy between how the elite policy making uh, community in Myanmar look at those expectations and how uh, let's say uh, you know the public uh, sort of uh, would look at those expectations so okay let's say um, you know Okay, let's start with the public thing, right? I mean, public thing. I mean, for the public thing, it's more straightforward, right? I mean, we, in the, we, we all, my, my, my parents live in the socialist regime, uh, and they always look into the West. Of course, you know, at the time, they have a socialist regime, so they always look into the bell band from the West, and they always look into the Beatles, and they always want to be the hippies of the West, too. So when I was young, too, I was in the military regime, so I was looking for the West, too. So public administration is the same. They always believe that uh, the West is going to be you know, safer from the socialist and military regime because you know the West always supporting the democratic movement and so on, this kind of thing until 2007, 2008, and, and 2012, 13. But you know we have been the cruel society for generations, right? So those when we start really opening up, the community and the public discourse are not ready yet, right? You know previously okay they thought okay the 
it's it's the same thing in like in Afghanistan as as you mentioned, right? Afghanistan during the time, you know, everyone is you know looking for the you know reform like the Soviets coming up. They always want to reform and everything. Once it's really coming up, they are not really ready yet. Same thing in Iran too, right? The same thing in Myanmar. So they are really shocked when not only you know, imagine you know you you are reading the newspaper mentioning about the nationalism and you know all or you know, don't trust on the West, da, 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 da. and within two, three months, and then those new people is mentioned about the gay right, lesbian right, at the same time, you know, at the right for the this and that, and a lot of folks are coming there. Those who are very conservative are not really happy with that thing at all, right? I mean, so they say, well, this is how the Ranger issue become bigger and bigger. You know, Ranger issue has been there for 40 years and people really don't give a damn. And the one day, you know, international communities start mentioning about that and they say, okay, you know what, the West is now trying to pressure us on us. So, and then you know things are start shifting, right? I mean, this is how the the the, the local community is start looking at the inter the West as another problematic issue. And interesting part is you know when we start opening up, uh, we open everything, right? So a lot of funds from the donors fund, a lot of grants have been you know coming in Myanmar. They invested. Myanmar has become a success story for everything, right? Because it's the new era frontier market, and because of these monies are coming to civil society organizations and then those who civil society and right group become more and more getting fund and those who do not get the funds who are conservative are really hated, right? So what they're going to do is they're trying to fundraise the stuff to counter it. And then when the international community stop the funding and grants all these CSO and NGOs stop working, but those whose conservative forces have a more like a grassroots organic, you know, organizations already rooted again. So these become now more like radicalized Buddhist movement, radicalized nationalists, everything is coming up as a counter, you know, product of these Western investors. This is how, you know, things have been shifted, right? So for the government, they got a pretty difficult situation, right? If you are at the military regime, you can easily choose, right? I mean, okay, we can do the modernism without having democracy, or we can become a, choosing the popular conservative force and we can keep get rid of power, they can choose a side. But for the democratic regime, it's a pretty difficult situation, like especially for current administration because they don't have the, they are not ideologically driven. They are more like a populist party. So they have to looking on, on whether we're gonna side with the Western values or whether we're gonna side and make it happy to the local community because they still need a vote because 25% is still ruled by the military. Another 50% is an ethnic population and they will get a vote so to form the government, they need at least 35% and this is how they're trying to you know, mingle around, you know, making things, you know, trying to put in everything, mix it up. So this is how they make a policy and this is how they're engaging with the West. Sometimes they are accepting the norm, sometimes they do not, sometimes they try to push it on, depending on the thing. But at the end of the day, the public discourse is a matter. Oh, I can hear you. Oh, I still cannot hear you. Now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> um, it's a rather interesting question here. Um, question is, um, you know, is it possible for Myanmar to decouple its economic ties with Beijing um, from its political ties? You know, and, uh, if yes, uh, what is Myanmar's best case scenario vis-a-vis -vis its ties with China going forward? If no, how far Myanmar is willing to go to signal its intention of preserving strategic autonomy, as you mentioned, to China beyond just merely suspending Chinese projects? So, you know, when we talk about the Chinese hegemony, is beyond the Chinese investment, right? Uh, of course, you know, to, to be honest, you know, I, I will talk to friendly on it. My economy is about 60 to 70% is based on the gray economy. That's mean we don't know where the money coming from, right? If you're looking at the data, the economy and everything, that's another story, but a lot of money is being circulated that's coming from the gray economy. That's maybe drugs, jade, mining, minerals, timber, all the illegal business activities. We cannot control this thing. So, so for the 
formal economy to keep it on run, we need the investment, uh, we need the proper business behavior, we need the compliance, we need the systematic structures and everything. That require not only capital, but also require technology transfers and also other different business thing. So, but if the Western countries do not invest, or if the other third countries like Japan or Korea or other countries are invested, Myanmar, of course, need to seek somewhere where the money is coming from. And a lot of you know those who are in the business sectors really looking for Chinese investment because this is the easiest way to keep the economy afloat for them. And it's especially in this kind of situation, right? You know, we got a sanction from the West because of the uh, uh, um, we don't get a sanction, but you know, consider if if the business coming from Europe or United States want to invest in Myanmar, what they're going to start looking on the sanction list from the United Nations and whether these companies have you know work closely with the those companies who who have been accused for the Rangers and human rights abuses. So this kind of due, long due diligence process make a difficult situation. And we are always in the high risk area. So the interest rate is always higher than other countries. So China is a lot more cheaper, a lot more easier to come in. They don't really do a lot of due diligence in this kind of level. So China will be there and then Beijing will be there and Beijing know this thing very well. That's one reason you know, they are trying to push it on. But when we talk about hegemony, it's not only about the make, make, make a project, right? I mean, let's, to be honest, right, I mean, the, we are in the era that uh, it is very rare to see that a lot of, you know, tanks, brigades are rolling across the borders and occupy. You know, this is not the era anymore, right? I mean, you know, it is not like China will come with a lot of, you know, people's liberation army will march into Myanmar. It, it, it will never happen. So the Chinese are even thinking that, you know, investing in Myanmar as a micro project is a high risk too. So, what, because what if Myanmar say, you know, okay, you know, from now on we nationalize the project and then, so, Bye bye, and then China cannot do anything because they cannot roll the tanks on the ground too. Right? Because this is not the way we can do it nowadays, right? So, what the what we are thinking is when we say Chinese hegemon is even beyond that is on the technological part, right? For example, nowadays about forty, sorry, not forty, sorry, eighty percent of the all of these smartphone in Myanmar. A Chinese version. It's imported from China. And almost all the smartphones around the border areas is already installed with the Chinese SIM card. That means they are already registered at the Alipay and WePay. That means all the business transactions are going through China. Some workers even pay their money with the Alipay and WePay and they even purchase from China and they survive. That means you know, almost all the border areas are basing on the Chinese whole financial ecosystem. Right, so they are also not investing on the ICT. Of course, you know, CMEC is agreement on the ICT infrastructure development. So there will be a lot of smart cities coming up with the Chinese investment too. And this is highly likely that Myanmar will also have a very early 5G network in upcoming upcoming uh, years. But you know, Myanmar econ ecosystem on the e-commerce is not there. Myanmar economy is ecosystem of fintechs is not there. So it's pretty sure that you know, Ali Express, Alibaba will be there. And you know, in the business sense, if you're looking on that, you know, for example, one of the largest uh, online payment uh, system, the digital wallet, the Wave Money, actually that is the owned by the Delano platform and with the Yuma Bank of Myanmar, and now that is invested by the Chinese and finance, right? So that's mean, you know, in the business sense, you know, there is no European Union or Myanmar or China. It's all about money, right? So in this all about money and technology thing, the China's influence more and more every day. So in upcoming years, imagine. In upcoming four to five years, if you are the if you are in the village, you order everything from the AliExpress and AliPay through the Chinese financial service. And when you need money, you use the this and finance from the Chinese microfinancing and you take the microfinancing. That is something that Hajimoni is pushing on. That is Hajimoni is not coming from the mega projects or the railway or the port. It's coming from the softball. I mean, it's, just, it's more on the technical part. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions, um, you know, it's, um, I think it's more or less related to rebel groups. Uh, yeah. But I would uh, try to frame it in a proper way. And then, uh, you know, there are two parts to the question. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I think we need to remember also that uh, Myanmar is perhaps, you know, one of the most ethnically diverse countries, you know, in the region. Uh, and that itself, uh, like it is in India's Northeast, uh, the ethnic diversity itself becomes, um, you know, a part and parcel of, let's say, identity politics, which uh, gets 
uh, reflected through ethnic uh, armed rebel groups. Um, so the first uh, question that uh, you know the audience is, I think, they're wanting to know is uh, the extent of, and I, I think this has been reported fairly by Western uh, uh, journalists also, the, the extent of uh, Chinese uh, role in uh, uh, you know, re uh, rebel groups in Myanmar, uh, for instance, the Hoa state, uh, and uh, how uh, difficult would it be for Myanmar to decouple that uh, that kind of a situation, uh, wherein uh, you know the Chinese might have a lever to pull, you know, uh, with the kind of influence it has in those groups. The second question is. Uh, uh, because we are talking about rebel groups in Myanmar, and it's anyone who writes on insurgency in the Northeast in India, uh, I think has been fairly accounted the kind of role, for instance, the Kachin Independent Army played in terms of uh, giving access to a number of Northeast insurgent groups to reach Yunnan. Uh, um, and the kind of reports which are coming up, for instance, during the COVID pandemic, there was a report of uh, the Tatmadaw handing over uh, 22 insurgent uh, leaders uh, to, you know, mid-level leaders to India from various parts in the Shanghai division. Um, and reports of, uh, you know, uh, people like Baresh, Baresh Barwa from the Ulfa living in the borders between Myanmar and Yunnan. So the first part is about China. The second part is how do you see the current uh, dynamic of India-Myanmar cooperation as far as counterinsurgency is concerned? So let's start with the China thing. Okay, uh, the thing is, you know, people just forget about one thing, right? I mean, not, not only people from our side, but even for the policy maker in Myanmar, forget one thing is that, you know, the central government of Myanmar never reached the full influence over the frontier area at all. Never in the history, never. So the, the most extended part that we have reached in the southern, uh, south, northern Shan, Shan state and southern part, but the you know, eastern part of San Luin at the Chinese border, we never reach out by the central administration. You know, until 1962, it was ruled by the, uh, you know, the Safwa is a thing like Maharaj, and they have their own autonomy and own administration. Before that, as a colonial time, they have their own administration. And then after the 1962, the Chinese Communist Party supported the Burmese Communist Party. They have their, and now they become YouTube SA and other strong groups there. Right. So it's the same thing to the other frontier areas too, right? So each of them have their own uh, administration, and we never fully reach the fully fully provide the services there. So that's mean you know if the central government cannot provide the services, and if there is a parallel services, that's mean you know we don't we are not fully controlled. That's mean there is other not other other non sick actors having influence in that thing. So. This is something that we cannot walk on just with the firepower, right? I mean, or counterinsurgency. Uh, I mean, even let's say about firepower. I mean, counterinsurgency when they say is in, including the political arrangement arrangements and other propagandas and other stuff too. But we cannot reach up there just firepower. So this is a matter of thing that we have to go through the peace process and go and make an agreement to form some kind of um, some kind of uh, security arrangement in the sub state level. This is a one reason the Myanmar military and Myanmar government is looking India as a model, right? So the problem is each of these, you know, groups and have their own area, own language, own identity, and they and they don't trust on the central government for the so the time. So they need their own national defense forces. I mean, I I I really don't mind on that because you know it's a everyone's construct the knowledge based on that experience right i mean this is, this is how epistemology works so uh so the problem is you know how we gonna arrange this kind of sub-state security arrangement is the issue that's the one reason we are now start looking on india so we need a, some kind of security arrangement that should be centralized command but at the same time that should reflect the proud and pride of the identity, at the same time not representing the single ethnic group, but more like a region. So, so Tamarok, sturdy Indian uh, model of, uh, you know, Assam rifle, Mizoram rifle, Manipur rifle, this kind of brigade formation style, and we study again, we are now also studying again, we also study on how these different, uh, you know, sub-state security arrangements and how these sub-state security forces have been formed. But this is something that we are looking on. For China, it's the same thing, you know. I mean, 
they 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 say you know they, they are they're there for the border for gen then and then they always need somewhere someone to you know put it buffer there is a real politics i mean you know they they will be they will be doing this for all the time until the war is there so and they they did it before and they will do it in the in the future too because you know those who are living in the border area they say they are speaking chinese and they but they are more you know closer to china you know people come first and border come later so this is how something we cannot fix it all for the Indian part, you know, we always cooperate with India, especially on the Indian intelligence, and then we are always looking to uh, stabilize the Western part. Uh, you know, that is something that is for two reasons. The first thing is, you know, those Western part areas, the kind of median and Chin state, is considered the least development. Also, consider India is the kind of least development region in the East too. So this is something, you know, a lot of potential out there. If we want to be security, we want to provide a secure, stable relationship. And you know, then keep the area more you know developed. Then we can do a lot more potential up there. This is one way. Another thing is you know, oh the the military to military relation between India and Myanmar to a certain point and certain level. We also love to share, and we also love to cooperate more on the that level. This is how we cooperate there. But we all know that you know those mid levels uh, armed group leaders are not that really harmful or. or both states, but it's more like a symbolic, you know, cooperation between the both com intelligence community and military remote relationship. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll come to the penultimate question, <laughs> and it's a very specific question. I think a lot of the audience members just want uh, to know an update from the Myanmar side because we keep, uh, you know, we keep um, reading about it in news media, and uh, and this is regarding the status of uh, the india myanmar thailand trilateral highway uh, and also the kaladan uh, multimodal uh, project so, so um okay so it's a funny part of the indian myanmar uh, thailand highway is of course the myanmar side is a wolf spot right you know, you know it right? indian india india highway from india from the uh Aizor to Galay is pretty good and from uh, from Calais to Mandalay is pretty bad, and then it's okay again for Thailand. It's okay again. So, so this is something that we need to upgrade, and you know, actually we can use it actually, but it's a matter of agreement between the government to start opening up, and then we can start using it. But uh, but we all know that you know not the eastern frontier provinces are India is far from the India India. This is a separate area. So India always want to get more connected to the mainland this is where the Kaladan project is kicking in but Kaladan project you know the successful Kaladan project is depending on the security of the Rakhine area so the Rakhine region this is somehow that you know India and Myanmar also, also Bangladesh need to consider a lot without having a security in Rakhine region I mean this, the Kaladan project will not going to be successful at all so of course, you know, Myanmar need a Kaladan project because it's the only old gateway from the Chin State, and then Chin State can use this seaport to you know start trading and everything because the 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 route from the driving route is pretty really bad, especially on the south of Chin State. So this is something that you know Kaladan project is a very long. I mean, you know, long mean um, it's been a, it's been a while since I was young and still still constructing. And that is because previous last decade is all about the financial issues and now it's more about the security issues but you know get it done and get it secure and stable rakhine region is the priority uh i think we should also be you know focused on and the government also need to focus on and this is this rakhine is a strategic interest not only for india but it's also china too and also myanmar too right i mean if if the rakhine issue is happening like this for upcoming years there will be no international investors and there will, there will be a lot of problematics and then we cannot engage with the west so this is something we need to get it done and then i think you know when we trying to solve the problems with the Rakhine issue we also need to how can i say uh coordinate together rather than blaming each other this is something the administration is looking forward uh, and they are not really happy with the west because the west is just you know uh, criticizing without anything because they can criticize because there is no interest in there but for india and china this for them is another story right i mean so this is something what kind of issues should be uh solved 
with the lead of India, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and China. And then, yeah, I think we can get it done. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, come to the last question and uh, my favorite question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, you know, let let me just put it this way. You know, uh, as a scholar, um, you know, like yourself, when I travel abroad, um, you know, the first things apart from whatever you know we are doing is uh, this expectation in conversations and otherwise to sort of like uh, be expected to be uh, to explain. Uh, uh, you know the identity and the image of the country that we represent, and uh, in my case, uh, it's more of like uh, saying that no, I'm not from Myanmar, I'm from India, and then you know I'm that part of India, and then sort of like take it as an opportunity for myself to explain the diversity of India and how different it is in different parts. Uh, you know, when you when you travel abroad and you've studied more, you know, for long years, you've worked in different parts of the world. Um, you know, how, you know, what kind of experiences do you have, like, of people expecting you to explain? Uh, I don't think that many people would uh, even like know like the uh, long history of pre-1962 and you know, post-1962 thing, and uh, how. Uh, I, I think most of the questions would come from, let's say, their popular imagination of. Dao Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, Myanmar, Saffron Revolution, uh, all kind of stuff. So uh, what kind of changes have you seen over the years in your, uh, in their expectations and also in your response to them in terms of explaining what is Myanmar and uh, maybe even from a public diplomacy point of view, of trying to explain Myanmar to, uh, and that really comes to the crux of what we are discussing now, which is, how the world sees Myanmar, right? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, of course, you know, when I, when I left Myanmar in 2000, uh, 2008 uh, to Sweden, of course, you know, it's always about the Saffron Revolution because the Saffron Revolution was in 2007. So, and then the Cyclonagis issues and humanitarian crisis in 2008, which is a popular, you know, topic up there. And 2009, 10, it's all about the upcoming election and then extension of the House of Rest of Autumn Suu Kyi. And 2011, 12, you know, quasi democratic transitions and people's trying to get fly in and what what is what's happened after the election. So I was I was on the there's there's a two camp there, the who don't trust on the election and then who thought you know we have to go for revolution and another camp that who we should come we should you know get in on the track with the constitution because we don't have constitution and we will win the election. We will try to win the election. I was on the election camp. So people criticized because you know they thought I'm you know yeah the guy that was supporting the military back constitution but I was but I was the guy that was supporting the constitutional reforms and republic I believe in republic so I say you know we will go there and so that and after 2012 to 2015 is all about reform success story reform and economic reform peace process this is thing 2015 as and you know 15 16. So 16 to 18, 17 is more about, you know, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the expectation for Aung San Suu Kyi. 18, 19 is more like a Rohingya issue. Then, then other, you know, uh, Myanmar's engagement with the West is quite low, this kind of thing. And 2020 is another election again and what's happening after. This is, a, this is what I experienced in the last 20 years. But, you know, what I want to see and what I always usually focus on is, you know, of course, you know, I don't really like to... Um, talk about the pre, you know, people usually refer on the pre-colonial time, right? I mean, I usually don't love to refer on this thing. I usually refer, and it might as more like somewhere between independence and 1962, right? I mean, I believe in republic, I believe in republicanism, so I believe in the Myanmar republic, and then I always say, you know, we are trying to make it more democratic republic state. And we are trying to be the technocrats to support the Republican values and keeping the Republican value firm on ground with the democratic principle. That is something I try to explain it. I'm always sitting on and trying to reach public to public relationship. You know, so it's the same thing. You know, when we talk about the uh, uh, Rohingya issues, we are always looking on the how citizenship and how the Republican value should be set on to overcome this crisis rather than looking on the identity thing like Buddhists or Muslims or Rangers or not. Are we always looking on the 
what the citizen of the Republic of Myanmar, right? I mean, the same thing on the national issue and national interest. We define national based on the idea of Republic, not as the nation, nation, but public discourse based on the Buddhism and the race, this kind of thing. So this is somehow I try to construct my discourse. Yeah. And yeah, this is something we try to push it on. Thanks a lot, Amara. Um, Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure on my part. Uh, I have learned so much and uh, you know, the number of questions that are there in the chat box, uh, you know, we have to have a part two to this sometime later. Um, you know, so um, uh, as I said, you know, we have engaged in something which is quite uh, fundamental and quite um, exciting in the sense that uh, I think what this session really did was to talk about so many issues um, which are not really, uh, let's say, reflected in mainstream media's focus on India-China competition and U.S.-China competition and, uh, you know, other things which are normally reported about Myanmar, right? So in that sense, um, I, you know, I, I, I really stand enlightened at the end of this uh, a little bit more than one hour of conversation. And now it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Ramod again to give the formal vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, uh, Mr. Amara Thia, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. It was an interesting presentation and we got a very comprehensive picture of Myanmar, which we really lack here in Nepal. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation and valuable time. We hope to see you in real in some days, like when things get normalized. I'd also sure. like yeah. to thank uh, Dr. Monish for moderating this event. Uh, I'd also like to thank all our participants and audience uh, for, the, for their presence. Uh, we hope to see you again tomorrow at new event we have on US-China rivalry, middle power, and the future of Indo-Pacific security at 2 p.m. Nepal time on Zoom. So please join us. See you tomorrow. Have a nice day. Thank you.